Um, so, so thanks for coming along today to our session about the decriminalization of seeds. Uh, and if we could have the first slide, or do I need to press next? Let me just have a go. No, I think someone needs to... Uh, we, uh, there we go, brilliant, thank you. So really what we're going to do today is tell you a story about um, the work that we've been doing with seeds over the last four years as a group and the history of that work over the last, really over the last 20 or so years. Um, but our particular story begins in 2020 when a small group of us were planning to visit uh, Dr. Steve Jones at the Bread Lab at Washington State University. And when we were about to fly out to Seattle, something happened and the flights were cancelled and we didn't make that journey. And so instead, Steve Jones took us for a virtual tour through the trial plots at Washington State University to look at all the different work they were doing with cereals, in particular wheat. And we felt it was just massively inspiring. And we decided to have lockdown remote drinks every Friday where we would talk about what we'd seen and think about how we could implement some of that in the UK. And one of the first things we began discussing on those Friday nights was the difficulty, the, the legal challenges to the sharing of this diverse, resilient seed and how we might begin to tackle that problem to make it legal for farmers to trade and exchange diverse cereal seeds that don't conform to DUS, that, that definition of uh, distinct, uniform, and stable, and aren't on the national list. So I'm going to do a little bit of context setting, and then I've got some fantastic speakers who will give you all the detail. So the bad news. We all know the bad news. We face a complex web of crises, I think it would be fair to describe them. They're sometimes called a polycrisis, and it's this combination of geopolitical, economic, societal, technological, environmental issues that we have to tackle. Everything from climate change to biodiversity loss through to things like the war in Ukraine and the impact that has to uh, chronic ill health through poor diet, through to the, the problems we're having the, with the economy, and all those things are connected, and it can feel quite overwhelming. The good news is that that, that thing, that polycrisis, that is a completely disempowering and disabling concept. It's useless. It does nothing for us but stop us acting. And the thing that we need to remember is that we absolutely don't have to do everything. We have to work in the realm that we understand and begin to affect change in that place. And the great news is as far as I'm concerned, we have all the tools we need to tackle that, whether it's economic, whether it's technological, uh, whether it's social. We know what we need to do, we just need to start doing it. And there isn't a silver bullet, there's no single answer, but what there is is a unifying concept which I think brings all these things together. And it's ridiculously simple, and that is diversity. Um, on farms, in our context, on plates, and across the food system. And I began my life as an ecologist in the, in the 90s, and then realized that food systems was where I could affect change in, in ecology. And I had the good fortune to meet uh, Professor Martin Wolf, who established Wakeley's Agroforestry in the early 2000s. And Martin introduced me to a whole new level of diversity that I'd never really thought about. I'd spent my life prior to that point thinking about what goes on around the field. Martin was focused on what happens in the field and had begun work with the Organic Research Center to create population wheats, these incredibly diverse uh, cereals that had resilience to disease, had the capacity to adapt to climate change, and could offer, over a long period, consistent yields without inputs. Incredibly exciting but no one was really finding a route to market for those crops that seemed like such an important answer. And in 2014, Martin and the Organic Research Center, working with DEFRA, achieved a Europe-wide derogation which allowed for the marketing of YQ and several other populations, what we'll be calling heterogeneous crops through this, through this piece, which is a, a word that simply expresses that diversity within the seed. And until 2021, we were trading those uh, grains, exchanging them between farms, understanding what the routes to market were, telling stories to customers and eaters about how these 
grains were a potential solution to a really complex set of problems. And also in this room, there are other people who are doing similar work. Andy Forbes is probably here somewhere. I can see John Letts over there. And there's a, there's a big history and a, and a big kind of building block of work that had been going on with diverse crops. So how are we actually doing? So this is the situation, really. Potentially, there are 300,000 edible plant species globally. About 200 of those are regularly eaten. 40 you might see in your supermarket, but just three comprise more than 50% of global calories. That's an extraordinary number, and all three of them are grasses. Uh, they're maize, they're wheat, and they're rice. And given that huge area, and given the fact that the genetic diversity within those three species has been consistently narrowed over the last 100 years in order to fit in with production systems that focus on yield rather than resilience and nutrition, we face the potential for big problems. We already see how rust drifts in across Europe and takes out varieties, and they break down, and we can no longer grow them. So our mission or our aim over the last four years has been to attempt to find a way to allow farmers to experiment with these more diverse cereals in order, we hope, to find some small solutions to some of these incredibly tricky problems. And I've got some great speakers up here with me. I've got Charlotte Bickler from the Organic Research Centre, Fred Price from Githelny Farm, Ed Dickin from Harper Adams University College, I've got Stephen Jacobs uh, from Organic Farmers and Growers, John Turner, a farmer at Little By Them, and then finally, I've got Rosie, who's got some real treats for us at the end. We're going to reward you for your patience with biscuits. And what they're going to do is they're going to talk about their relationship with these diverse cereals. They're going to talk about what they like to grow, how they work from the perspective of a plant breeder, how they work from the perspective of a miller and a baker. And at the end, we'll have time for some questions. So I'm going to let them push on with that narrative, think about the questions that you want to answer, and we'll have some time at the end for that. Thank you. <laughs> Do I have to turn it on? OK, perfect. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Desire, for the great introduction. So we've got a photo here of the first seed crop of ORC Wakeley's population being grown at Green Acres Farm in Shropshire in 2017. And this is the first seed crop at scale when we were allowed to begin marketing it. It was a real change in how we were doing things because before that, every seed that was sold in the UK had to conform with the DUS criteria that Josiah introduced. This relaxation of the seed, relaxation of the seed laws is known as a temporary experiment and it ran from 2014 to 2021. So we find that there are a range of laws that impact how we can ch ex produce and exchange seeds. So this ranges from intellectual property to seed health and food safety. But the most challenging aspect which we were looking at during this experiment was around seed marketing laws and how we can relate to seed marketing when we have a genetically diverse crop that we're working with. What we see is that the laws that were developed were for a different time. It focused on industrial crop production, anonymous markets, and external and top-down control. And as Josiah said, we're now facing a different range of challenges, and we need to be able to adapt our systems to that and review how these laws work. So what we see in our current system can create barriers to innovation, you know, innovation that is different to what we're kind of pushing for sometimes around diversity and ecology. And it creates prohibitive systems of administration and limits opportunity for smaller breeders and people that are trying to develop crops for smaller markets or less developed markets because the controls in that create a lot of um, need for scale, especially at the beginning. So what we observed when we were working within this first framework in the 2014 to 2021 was that there were a number of challenges around how the current system for seed marketing um, determines and um, maintains control. And it's very much to do with the variety, identification, and description being tied into the seed. So we see that an individual plant of a variety can be used to say that that's that variety across the whole area that it's grown in, generally. But when we get to a more diverse cropping system, it becomes impossible to do that. So we have to look at a range of different features. And this can cover 
populations that have been generated in lots of different ways, so farmer selections, dynamic populations of outcrossing mixtures, and composite cross populations like ORC Wakelin's population, or YQ as it's known. So we worked with the Commission at a European level to understand what the key features that we needed to be able to monitor to change the system would look like. And these are what are described here. So there should be some kind of general understanding of the characteristics that you can expect from a variety or population, understanding of the breeding history, the parent material, the selection pressures that it's been exposed to, and where it's been produced and when. And that needs to be maintained from year to year as we understand that these populations can evolve in response to those selection pressures. So the regulation can define what a population is and then how we measure it, but these methods will be slightly different depending on the type of material that you're working with. And we're beginning to unpick that in more detail as we develop and grow these different types of crops. It's not a one size fits all, so we have to keep adapting to that. The real emphasis that we see on the regulatory side is that we don't want people who have worked hard to register a variety then getting undermined in the system. So it's about showing that what we're growing as a population isn't just a registered variety and could have been registered through the DUS system or a mixture of those types of varieties. The main challenge within current marketing legislation is that the variety is used for the identity and we need to find ways to work around that. And that really comes down to us working together to understand how we can do that. So what we've observed is when we get to a more genetically diverse crops, we see the real increasing importance of the context that they're being grown in and the processes that support that be, being to be understood and um, documented as best as possible. But really like building up that trust in bottom down rather than bottom up rather than top down approaches. Um, I'm going to pass over to Fred now because he's had a great experience of trying to work with that on Grothenly Farm. Do you mind clicking my thing on? Okay. okay. That's my one slide. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Hi, everyone. I'm Fred. Um, and as I said, I farm at Grothenly Farm in Bridgewater in Somerset, um, where I've been since 2007. And um, I guess to level with you all, I I think probably the first half of my farming life, I spent coming to terms with feeling trapped by a kind of high input chemical intensive agricultural system. And the perspective I wanted to bring today really was how heterogeneous material populations, specifically the YQ for me, um, played a really big role in a transition away from that to something, a farm that felt a bit more ecological. Um, and a farm that was embedded in a food system that was a bit more human scale. Um, I, on the way here this morning, uh, drove down, I don't know, I did Google and I came here, but anyway, I was looking out the window, I don't know quite where I was, but there was wheat everywhere it seemed, I don't know, every other field, every third field. And just for perspective, um, uh, one in six of those fields, that's 15% of all the wheat grown in the UK, quarter of a million hectares was one single variety, probably, uh, KWS extase. Um, ah, that's two million, two and a half million tons of wheat grown in the UK where every single grain is genetically identical to the next one. Um, and I'm not trying to say that KWS is a bad wheat, obviously quite the opposite. It's a brilliantly adapted wheat, but that's exactly the problem. It's a victim of its own success. As a farmer growing KWS extase, in two years you will have to replace it. It will break down to disease. And that's the picture on your right-hand side. On the left is YQ, which, um, as we've said, is a population wheat. So 20 parents in YQ's case, 190 crosses, maybe half a million different genotypes in the same field. Um, so YQ is as diverse as extase is uniform. And what that kind of genetic diversity that YQ has, um, it brings a kind of evolutionary potential, and breeders call this mass selection. Farmers, we understand it as farm-safe seed. Sowing, harvesting, re the same seed on the same farm year after year. And the impact this has on the population is that it adapts, evolves, endures. Um, if extase has a kind of inbuilt obsolescence, YQ is resilient. And consider this, 
I could grow YQ for the rest of my farming life, and uh, it wouldn't need to be replaced. It would probably get better. Um, and and that, that, that's really powerful. Um, John and I are the farmers up here. And um, I first visited John's farm five or six years ago. And with hindsight, it had a very profound effect on me. Um, John's crops felt wonderfully productive and abundant. Um, and I really couldn't believe at the time that between drilling and harvest, there was no intervention in the field. When the tractor and the drill left, the next thing in was with the combine. And John told me this, and I, I just didn't believe him as a conventional farmer and a spray contractor at the time. And um, I, left, I left really with, with a different kind of perspective, that at home I had been trying to impose myself on the system, that everything had become a battle, and that I was trying to adapt and change my environment to grow the wheats that I wanted to grow. Um, and uh, I guess it was the first kind of sense I had of what feeling ecocentric was compared with the kind of ecocentric model that I had been pursuing at home. Um, and the YQ was a big part of this mental shift for me because in the YQ, I'd found a wheat, a heterogeneous wheat, a population wheat that would over time adjust to the characteristics and the challenges of my farm. So in terms of breeding terminology, the YQ is an adaptive variety. The x is adapted. And uh, then we fast forward to the last kind of four or five years when I met most of these lovely people here, including Rosie, who has her bakery on the farm, Field Bakery. And that's really a reflection of um, I was trying to, I, I realized that it, there's only so far you could change your practices as a farmer when, without considering the wider economic context of the farm. Um, and the business that I was running was really deeply embedded in a commodity system of agriculture. And that brings with it a relentless, relentless focus on yield and scale and therefore simplicity. Um, and the other thing with a commoditized system of, of, of of the commoditized food system is effectively you are very disconnected from the consumer. So there was no way of communicating the values embodied within a different approach that I'd seen at John's. And I wanted a grain economy that would support me as a farmer in deciding how I wanted to farm and work backwards. And you know, with hindsight, the YQ population took me on that journey as well. Um, because if the extase is a variety that's defined by its uniformity, then YQ is defined by the people and the place and the farm on which it grew, it's, it's absolutely a human identity. And that kind of identity is really powerful. And around a wheat like YQ, relationships and trust can build. And uh, a much more connected human scale food system can emerge. It's a system in which me as the farmer, I felt empowered to make my own decisions and choices on the farm. Um, and it's a system that empowers everyone in the chain. And one of those people is the breeder. So, we have a very own seed breeder up here today, Ed Dickin. Over to you, Ed. Ah, thank you very much, Fred. So I got started out in this sort of grainy world with um, interest in naked barley. Naked barley is barley for human food. So it threshes freely from the husk, and you can use it in all sorts of all sorts of products. Why do you want to eat barley? Well, it tastes delicious, first of all. It's a low input crop, as we all know. It gives more uh, options in our rotations. But naked barley also has health benefits. It can help lower cholesterol and deal with type 2 diabetes by moderating uh, the release of, blood, uh, of glucose into blood sugar. Unfortunately, we don't eat very much barley, and the varieties that are suited for human food just don't, are very, very rare. And the, the key reason for that is the breeder and the user, as in the farmer, are different people, as we saw in, in Charlotte's and Fred's presentation. And where the breeder is a different person, they're trying to breed for a market. That market has to be there to make it worthwhile breeding the variety in the first place. 
So with a small but growing market, that's, that's why naked barley got forgotten about. So I started doing my own crosses. And that got me on to the idea that it's not just important what you cross with what, it's how you handle the material afterwards. So in conventional breeding, you're a breeder, you're trying to breed for a, a market, you're trying to produce a product, a product that you can sell and it needs to be on the national list to legally sell it, it needs to be DUS. So you're trying to get to, towards a uniform product and the, the 20th century way of doing that is the pedigree method where you do a cross, the F1, the F1 self-pollinates to the F2s and you usually have about two to 3,000 F2s that then become the, the plant families and then you select within and between them. And then you can speed that up a bit with marker-assisted selection. We don't need to go into that a lot. But the, the fundamental goal is to get to a uniform uh, type of variety. Whereas me with naked barley, I thought, well, I don't actually need to do that. I'm making crosses with Tibetan or Syrian, very diverse barleys crossed into UK varieties. And then I'm wanting to throw away a lot of that diversity. So why not keep it? So that's what I've been doing, partly as a bit of a hobby, partly um, uh, with, uh, with the students at Harper Adams, and now we've got funding through um, Horizon 2020 program, a uh, project called Crop Diva, Climate Resilient Orphan Crops for Diversity in Agriculture. So we're also doing intercropping as part of that. But through that link with people involved in uh, diverse grains and things, also got into land race wheats. Land race wheats are like, you can think of them as a traditional breed, similar to traditional breeds of livestock. And this is from when the farmer and the breeder are the same people. A land race develops with the culture of where it's been growing to suit the food systems and the types of, types of growing. So I started taking some of these and crossing them into modern wheats. Modern wheats aren't all bad by any means. There's some very, very useful traits, things like orange blossom midge resistance, higher yields, better standing ability. And again, it seemed a bit of a waste to then try and produce a uniform variety, partly because I'm not a professional plant breeder. I'm not going to try and get stuff on the recommended list. So I started making crosses and I had the, the, the pleasure to have, have met Martin Wolf, so I started stealing his idea and making my own population. So my own population is all of these different diverse, modern cross with land races, and then mixed together. So far there's only 20 crosses, whereas YQ is 190. But each of those crosses, potentially, you've got two to 3,000 individual combinations. One of the things about these land race, wheats, uh, land race wheats, they are very resilient. This is a picture taken in 2018. You can see the modern wheat grown on quite light land. It's just given up. Whereas on the same day, the crosses from the land races, they've still got color in them. They're still thinning. They're, um, and their specific weight was a lot higher. They'd filled properly. They'd finished because they've got better root system. Uh, 2022, we had drought again. You can see the, the wheat turning white, apart from that next to it, which is rivet wheat. Rivet wheat is a forgotten type of wheat. It's related to Durham wheat, but it's Durham's tough northern cousin in a way. And we grew it up to the 1950s and then forgot about it. So my, my population, calling Oak Farm population, again, stealing the idea off Martin Wolf. So Wakelin's after Martin Wolf's farm, Oak Farm after my parents' farm. And this is, these photos are anecdotes rather than scientific evidence, but the, the scientific papers show that populations and blends, they do reduce the amount of disease considerably. So these were grown in the same field uh, a couple of years ago. And you can see they've had the, the same fungicide program. Anybody who's a conventional farmer, we know we're losing fungicides as well. And you can see a lot greener. There are other advantages of keeping some of that resilience and keeping the diversity. Um, the picture there is a, a DUS inspector's nightmare. You can see the wheat is all different heights. 
And one of the, the conversations we had with Steve Jones, he said, well, if you've got 10 to 15% tall ones, that's an extra canopy, and they're not gonna shade out the ones below. So you've got an extra layer of canopy going down through. So it looks scruffy, but you actually get a, an advantage. And some of those tall ones, if you were selecting individual varieties, you'd have to throw them away, because if you just grow a whole field of those really tall ones, they'd be lodging, but whereas they're part of a mix, they're fine. So this got me thinking about, it's the system of plant breeding, not just the genetics. So oak farm population has modern genetics in it, but it's the system to try and get to uniform varieties, because the breeder and the farmer are different people. And that wasn't always the case, and it's not the case today with livestock. If you've um, read some of the, the works of James Rebanks, he's talking about adapting his genetics of the sheep to, and the cattle, going, going back to uh, belted galloways, to suit the forage, rather than having to reseed with ryegrass and use fertilizer and lime and bought in concentrate. So a livestock farmer, especially if they're going on a more regenerative path, whatever you want to define regenerative as, they're, using the, they're adapting their genetics to suit their system. But with crops, we have to decide what system we'd like to farm, like Fred was telling us, and then try and find some genetics that fits in with that from a list of products that are available. So one of the real powers of this method of breeding is, as you saw on Charlotte's slide, it reintegrates the breeder and the farmer. There's no reason why a breeder and a farmer can't be different people. So this is oak farm population. You see, again, looking wonderfully scruffy, but it's also pretty as well. So one of the other things I'm playing around with is crossing rivet, so Durham's northern, tough northern cousin, into Corazan wheat, which produces beautiful pasta. The Corazan wheat does, but you can't really grow it here. When you do a cross, I've done a bit of selection in to get the best ones, but produce something that will make very, very good pasta, grows fairly reliably, the yield isn't too bad. It's absolute pig to combine. I don't know if you can see them in that picture, but it tends to, you get gather, uh, bunches gathered up at the edge. Um, but what it does do is produce loads and loads of straw, um, and the worms absolutely love it. So that field uh, now, uh, we direct drilled it with beans and that really worked really well. You can see the worms pulling down that straw. And that's again, one thing we've forgotten about, that the, the job of the crop is to produce food for the soil as well. So I will uh, pass myself on to Steve. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so I'm gonna, um, I'm going to start with why would, I'm Stephen Jacobs from Organic Farmers and Growers with the largest certifier of organic land in the UK. Why would an organic farmer be interested in a population? So let's start at the beginning. It's an Organics 101, you probably all know this. We don't bring on synthetics, fertilizer. It's all about cycling nutrients. Here it's clover, also use of livestock. Um, and so what's the problem that we've got with the current seed breeding programs is that they aren't built for this system. They're built for the system that's been described where the plants are bred in order to, to grow in a system that will require synthetic inputs, artificial fertilizer, fungicide, etc., etc. Organic farmers can't use those, don't use those. So what do we do instead? And how did we get into this position where these polarized situations have occurred, where there's a lot of synthetics on one side and nothing on the other? So this is a slide from, I've got three of these just quickly. This is just mapping out, this is down to Phil Howard, who is with Michigan State University and also IPES Food in Brussels. This is about agribusiness consolidation. Nothing wrong with that, it's not illegal. Big companies buy smaller companies all the time. But if you look at the progression, you can see that Bayer have just eaten Monsanto and now we're down to even less companies. And of these companies, the big corporate owners 
tend to own both the seed houses and the businesses producing the synthetics you need to grow those varieties. It's not in every case, but it is dominating the landscape. And it's going on. It's still happening. So for us to go and grow these things, say, for instance, you've got to get a million wheat spec, a non-organic farmer can put synthetics on and try and encourage more protein. An organic farmer can't do that. I want organic grains. What am I going to do? So I'm just going to pay respect now to somebody who couldn't be with us today, unfortunately, Kimberly Bell, because it was through desire that I met Kim. Kim is a baker at Small Food Bakery in Nottingham, and she introduced me into a way that we could use Martin's YQ in a loaf of bread. Because my problem was I could persuade organic farmers to grow the YQ, but who were they going to sell it to? So that's where the bakers come in. We'll hear from, from Rosie in a second. So my last slide, guess which one is the YQ and which one is the modern variety? I'll tell you, the YQ is the one without any poppies in it. Pretty as they are, obviously, that's a weed. This photo was from Mark Lee, who's an organic farmer in Shropshire, incidentally hosting the National Organic Conference next week. This, Mark says, is his best photo ever. I'm sure he's got brilliant photos of his kids. But this is a pretty good photo. The point here that's being illustrated here is that the YQ, the Wakelin's population, will outcompete the weeds in an organic system where you cannot use herbicide. So Mark has reduced his plowing. He's cultivating with various lighter tillage systems. He's got living mulch. He's got his crop rotation. His fertility build is clover and livestock. And this wheat really suits his system. And talking of farmers, I'll now hand you over to John Turner. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Um, yeah, so John Turner, we farm in sort of southwest Lincolnshire, just above Stamford. And like Fred, um, we, we we sort of try, we do take a sort of an innovative approach. We always try and remain open to what, you know, where we want to be five, 10, 15 years time. But we're also what I call brutally commercial. It has got to stack up. You know, at the end of the day, the rent's got to be paid. The machinery's got to be paid for and that sort of thing. So we, you know, probably more so than, than you know, one or two others have to focus on how we get from where we want to be to what we can actually do tomorrow very, very quickly. Uh, my introdu our introduction to, uh, to diverse grains, population grains, um, I think Kim must have been doing quite a lot of badgering in 2017 because we normally sit down at this time of the year with the windmills and with the bakers and say, okay, what do you want us to plant this autumn? We do the, the entire mapping for the next cropping year now and they have to make a commitment that what comes off the fields in, well, it'd be 2024, they will be buying right through to 2025. And that's a real um, trust, it's a, it's a relationship based on trust. And, you know, we do our part, they do their part, and that's what makes it all work. And I, I think you're very much the same, aren't you, Fred? So, 2017, um, we will sit down with the mill, what do we want to be growing, and, uh, Paul at Tuxford Windmill said, look, we supply Kim at um, Small Food with quite a lot of flour. She wants us to grow some YQ under this commercial trial. I said, yep, well, that's it. She's going to commit to uh, buying it. We will grow it, certainly. Popped it in the ground. And it was only then that we sort of started to understand the legislative um, context of this. It was done under a commercial experiment. And that market is an important one because it's not only the legislation that controls the seed and the availability of the seed, but in a farming world, it also actually, you know, it controls the marketing. If you're sell it, selling a milling wheat off on that passport, you've got to have the name of the milling wheat, and that's got to be a recognized name of milling wheat. There's no way I could put YQ on my passport if this was going to go off in a lorry, which is the default market 
it would have to go as animal feed, and I've got absolutely no interest in producing food for animal feed on our farm. You know, we're trying to do stuff for human consumption. So yeah, back to that conversation with Kim um, and the commercial experiment. We put it in, and I was quite skeptical for the first autumn. You know, we put it in, and compared with the other stuff, we thought this. Yeah, this really isn't very special, but come the spring, I mean, that just kept going and going and going. And when all the other single varieties started that senescence that Ed was talking about, they kept going and it was the best yielding. And it, that's been the same. We've grown that every, every year. We farm safe seed that. That has developed as a local land race on our farm for six years. We would, I would put this spring, this autumn and next spring, I would put all crops down to population if there was the market for it. So in terms of where we're going from now for the next sort of um, tranche of this sort of commercial experiment, the development work is to start to look at that marketing and how we start to take that to scale. And that's gonna be all about building confidence. Charlotte mentioned the 1964 Plant Varieties Act. That came in to sort of give us a structure to enable farmers to buy seed with confidence that what they thought they were buying was actually what they were buying and that it was disease free and it was going to perform. And we need those same sort of um, guarantees or confidence building if we're going to take this forward to scale. That commercial experiment that framed, that gave us the, 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 the space for this initial tranche of work to happen was an EU one. And one of the objectives of that that um, ORC worked um, with DEFRA was about whether you could actually identify and authenticate a seed by, where, by its traceability, by tracing it back through the generations rather than an inspector going into a field saying, yeah, that's my, that's my control and yes, that's the same as, as that. Because you've got a, an incredibly diverse one and I think even us who have been growing it for five or 10 years and looking at a YQ, it's, it's a sort of almost, it's a gut feeling, yes, that is YQ or there's quite a few off types in here. So this traceability um, is a really important factor. Originally, on that initial experiment, this was done on a spreadsheet, and poor old Charlotte and her colleagues in the office had to maintain that, keep firing that into it to, to DEFRA. And it's fairly clear that as one farmer then sold it to another farmer and it was swapped, m maintaining that contact and getting, gathering that data was going to be even more difficult. So what I'm going to do is give you a very quick work through, uh, walk through um, a tool called Heterogen, which we've developed collectively, which will hopefully take us from the initial um, uh, process of putting them on a spreadsheet to one where everybody as a grower or as a merchant can maintain records of what they're doing, and that reduces the central admin burning. So this is a, it's a sort of a shared responsibility in delivering the same objectives that that 1964 Plant Act um, was intended to deliver, but by taking ownership of it, taking responsibility of it, hopefully we can make that 1964 Act redundant. That's where we're hoping to go, or certainly I'm hoping to go. So each of them, and, and actually heterogen is the sort of the name with gen being information, heterogen, it's a sort of reflection of it. Throughout its development, we've, we've been, it's been informally called John's tool, so I'm really pleased that we've moved on to, to heterogen. It's uh, far, far happier with that. Um, so everyone takes ownership of their business, when in this case it's us, little, little um, person on the map and a little bit of a sort of a biog of the farm. And the idea is that in the next iteration of the development, what we can do is a sort of have a link from a profile so that somebody goes into a field, QR code, they can learn about the farm and about the crop. Um, the farmer will be able to map the fields um, just simply by clicking on a dot. Oh, that's me done seven minutes, sorry about that. <laughs> Farmers must stop talking. Um, so they can map the fields very, very quickly. Um, there's a traceability process, which is basically, it monitors the, the seed coming in. So when, let's say, that initial batch of seed came from Fred to me, on my dashboard, the only thing I would have on that is, is seed that's come in from a, a, a supplier that is on the system already. So hence that sort of, um, 
I know that I'm getting it from an authenticated source. Throughout me growing it, I map the fields that it's gone in, the seed rate, the area, and also I can do the harvesting data, what it's yielded, um, things like grain quality, protein, Hagberg, those sorts of things. And if it's going on to seed as well, either as farm safe seed for me, or sell to another um, person, we put that germination rate, we put in the phytosanitary stuff, make sure that you know we're not taking bunt and septoria and passing that on to somebody else. So that's how we're hoping to deliver these sort of standards, a professional standard for, that these crops really deserve. And also by compiling that sort of information, what we can do is um, build a picture of, let's say for Oak Farm or uh, YQ, Typically, what would farmers expect in real life situations about protein, yield, Hagberg, its usage, that sort of thing, and build that real life picture based on, on the farmer participation, which is the sort of innovative farmers and the live, live wheat sort of approach to things. If we're placing it on the seed, what we'll do is generate a seed label, and that forms part of a family tree. And this is, at the moment, we're just using some dummy data, which we've used to test the system. We're going to have a session, I think, this afternoon between two and three on the agroecology stand. And if anybody's interested, we can um, just take you through it. But every new seed label goes onto this family tree, and that's traceable right back to that very first source, the, the, the work that Martin put in, the work that Ed's put in, um, and hopefully, you know, in, in five and ten years' time, we'll be dealing with a lot more populations. Why bother? Um, I think we need to think what the alternative is. This can, let's be honest, this can continue. It can happen under the radar, um, little farmer-to-farmer -farmer bits of seed um, being exchanged. But if we want to take this, if we want to, you know, I feel if we want to really unlock the true potential of these crops, unlock the markets for them, it needs to be a collaborative approach. And everybody in there has got a part to play. Farmers have got a part to play, breeders. And we've got this wonderful system that I think has evolved over, you know, the, the course of this temporary experiment, where we've got these very close connections, you know, almost from, from the harvest, I can say how it's grown, we can pass it on to the miller, he'll tell us how it's milled, Rosie can tell us how it baked, and that goes straight back to Ed um, and the breeders, and you get a very fast information exchange. Talking of millers and the bakers, over to Rosie. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Rosie, and I have a brilliant bakery on Gothany Farm called Field Bakery. It's about an hour down from Bristol on the M5, if you're ever passing. Um, it's open every Saturday um, to the general public, and that means mainly locals to the farms. There's a lot of villages close by, other farmers, lots of farming families often come to the farm. Um, and ironically, being someone that lives in the countryside, the often access to good food is, is quite evasive. So this has been a real, um, joy for the people that live around there actually to come to the farm and I often look up from pulling loaves out of the oven and just see everyone chatting in the queue and getting to know each other and that's a really good part of, of having a bakery on the farm. So just in context I'd been baking for about seven years before I started the bakery at Gothany. Um, I'd mainly worked with commodity white flour so very low extraction white monoculture wheat. Um, it didn't have much flavour I was sourdough fermenting it, so I was feeling a bit more happy about that because I was putting more nutrition into the, to the bread. But I knew there was a big problem there to be solved of where that grain was coming from and what system it was supporting. Um, so I moved to London for a bit, worked at E5 Bakehouse, which was committed to using UK-grown organic wheat. Um, and that was a big learning curve because they fresh mill in the bakery. Um, I met lots of people there, such as Kim at Small Food, who's been really inspirational as another baker who's championing these um, diverse wheats. Um, and I also met Fred around that same time, came to the farm, started to have a lot more conversations about how, what his parameters were and, and, and me as a baker, what I was looking for. And we aligned on a lot of values around the climate crisis and wanting to do something about it. So I think a lot of bakers might feel 
like I did in the, did in the past, quite um, overwhelmed with the problem and the scale of the problem and think, how can I actually get involved with doing something positive? Um, so using Grain Direct was actually one of those things that I could do. Um, there was a little um, baking excursion to America where I started baking over there for about seven months and I worked in bakeries that contained a mill in, importantly, and they were working direct with farmers and I tasted some amazing breads. And I think having those experiences really gave me the confidence to set up the bakery at the farm because I knew that bread could be better than what was available in our supermarkets, if we can all even call that bread. Um, so, this is what I have to work with. Lots of populations, lots of different mixtures. These are from different farms, not just Fred. Um, it gets cleaned on farm um, so that it's milling quality, clean cleanliness, wheat. Um, and then we mill it on this new American stone mill, which is a 40 inch um, stone mill. It's built in Vermont. And um, I spent a lot of time with the mill maker and the bakers working with this mill over in the States. They're now all over the world, so they're really taking over in terms of that kind of connected, small-scale milling, getting grains out to people's plates locally. So they're a really good um, tool, and we share that tool. So Fred and I co-own it, because um, it, and I also mill for other bakeries. Importantly, I didn't want to hold on to this beautiful experience of working with fresh flour. I wanted to spread it as far as wide within my network that I could. So I do a lot of wholesale, whole grain flour to other bakeries. Um, we also have workshops for those bakers to encourage them to use this flour and to show them techniques and ba basically build their skill level. I think that's something that I'd like to mention is, as a baker, there's only so far you can go with white flour and there's so much more to learn. There's so much more flavor out of using diverse grain and so much more beauty in the job and connection with other people who work in this. So farmers, millers, bakers, all of them hanging out a bit more together and sort of learning from each other. Um, so this is doing a workshop. We do a lot of workshops, not just beginner or sourdough workshops, but with professional bakers. Um, on the left, there is some, some loaves that I made out of three Southwest farmers grain. Uh, all made beautiful loaves, really tasty, all 100% stone ground flour, some of them 100% YQ as well. Um, and I just wanted to prove the point that bakers with skills in sourdough fermentation can actually work with wheats that are actually outside of the very narrow um, parameters that m bigger scale mills set up. And I also think about every time I'm mixing dough, how's that been grown? Um, the people involved in it. And it brings me a lot of joy to actually give that to my customers. I feel really proud of the bread that we put out to people. Um, and I think that's an experience that I'd love other bakers to be part of. Um, here is the Southwest Grain Network doing its thing, getting together, um, learning about milling here, learning a bit about farming as well at Gothany. So we try and get together regularly. Um, there's lots more plans in the future of how we can do that even better. Um, and there's a real conversation within the group about how to use diverse wheats and how to get hold of some of these populations, um, which is going to be great for us as a community to all be buying into it and all be using it and learning from each other. This is a workshop. So often we'll spend some of the time in the bakery in the morning, mixing doughs, feeling things, talking about our experiences of working with these flowers. And then we'll spend a lot of time in the afternoon outside with Fred in the field, looking at diverse wheat. So this is in the trial plot, which is beautiful because it's a patchwork of um, heights and colors. And um, at nearer to harvest, it gets really, really beautiful. Um, yeah. we. We're really lucky to be able to see that. And I think that experience of spending time in a farm as a baker who 
um, might not have been able to access that before. So even going on to a farm through a farm gate can often feel a bit intimidating. Um, I think this is a really good way of getting more people involved. So open your farms up, not every day, but um, occasionally is a good idea. And just to, just to show you what we do, this is all made with YQ wheat, which is one of the populations that I work with. Um, obviously, different other things have gone into there, butter being one of the main <laughs> other ingredients. Um, I do wholesale bread into Bristol as well to a couple of restaurants and to a very nice big bread club who are committed to supporting the farm and what we do here. And they're all aware of what we do and how these grain, grains are grown importantly. So they trust in Fred and I to bring that food to them and make decisions for them that benefit their own nutrition and their enjoyment of food. And they keep coming back, so I think it's working. Um, and yeah, I think I'd like to pass over. We've done that. Oh, one thing to mention is we did make biscuits. I did make biscuits. And they're fresh milled whole grain flour from three populations um, developed by these guys here, um, as well as Wakelands from Martin Wolf. Uh, and I'd like you to taste them and just take a minute to appreciate what good food is. Thanks. Can anyone hear me? Ah, oh, yeah, 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 there we go, brilliant. Um, well, thanks everyone for that kind of really broad perspective about why it is that these diverse cereals are so important. They're resilient, they're tasty, they're nutritious, they bring together communities, um, they offer a, a, a part of the answer to those complex questions that we were discussing right at the beginning. And I think what's been really critical in this journey that we've been on over the last four years is that we've been talking to DEFRA, we've been talking to other stakeholders, as you might broadly call them, who are you know, conventional breeders, and trying to understand how we can assure those kind of very conventionally minded processes that, that we can kind of look after this process without spreading disease or, or undermining the role of the breeder, which is critically important. We need to reward that work that people like Ed are doing. Um, and much to our surprise, to be honest, um, last week we had, um, we had some communication from DEFRA that um, and this is my Neville Chamberlain moment. Let's hope, <laughs> let's hope that it, <laughs> this doesn't come home to haunt me. But um, so good. DEFRA put before Parliament a statutory instrument. That's a piece of secondary legislation that doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be de debated in Parliament. It's essentially an amendment to the 2011 seed marketing rules, which essentially says that for the next seven years, until 2030, from the 13th of July this year, we can run another experiment looking at how these diverse cereals might fit into the picture of UK agriculture. It's really, really exciting. Really, really exciting. And, and this, this, this will allow us to demonstrate, one, that we're all very responsible and, and, and a safe pair of hands, as it were, but also that there are other metrics, there are other things we need to be measuring when we look at whether a cereal is suitable for production on farms. And that includes the connection, that includes the flavor and the nutrition, that includes the adaptive capacity to particular agroecosystems. And we're gonna use this seven years to demonstrate that in the hope that we can convince DEFRA and the government, whoever that may be at that time, and who knows, um, that we can change the primary legislation, that we can adapt that 1964 Act to prevent the criminalization of farmers. Because as has been said, it is possible to swap and exchange those seeds. It's technically not really the correct thing to be doing. Uh, but if we're gonna really spread this out across the farming community, we need to do it openly and transparently and with kind of demonstrable benefits, not kind of backhanders. And, and, and that problem that existed and that created the 1964 Act, which was farmers not knowing what it was that they were growing on their farms and disreputable seed merchants selling material that wasn't what it was supposed to be. So it's incredibly exciting. Delicious big skits from Field Bakery. Very little time, but we have got time for a couple of questions, I think. So if anyone has a question, Ben. Um, oh, there's a microphone, but it's... it's... Thanks, uh, Ben Reynolds from Sustain. Um, so in this next trial, if you get it, fingers crossed, um, what seeds, what cereals um, would you be trialing and for what market? Would it still be for ultimately for flour into bakeries or 
It, it could be anything. It's very open. So all the, all the main cereal species are included, and the definition of what is a heterogeneous crop is very wide as well. So it'll include those land races. It'll include things that have been developed on farms through mixtures that have then outcrossed. It'll include things like YQ. And we've talked a lot about YQ. YQ is not the answer. Martin never felt it was the answer. YQ has been the wedge that's opened the door um, and, and helped us to think differently about all of this serial work. So we hope there'll be a whole new wave of things, things like Ed is doing, you know, creating a Coruscant rivet cross that's brilliant for pasta. You know, there could be all sorts of things that emerge from this. Oh, yep. Hi, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Uh, do you think it's possible to legitimize existing other populations through this online platform? Um, or, or is it more the case that the populations will have to be born out of this sort of coming existing framework and sort of carefully, uh, you know, identified, tracked and traced uh, from, from now? Or, or can you sort of go retrospectively almost? We can go retrospectively. Charlotte's probably a better place to... Yeah, we're going to work to build back the records so we can start to build a picture of what these seeds do, where they've been. Um, it will rely on us all working together to unpick the historic information. Um, but yeah, that's why we're really excited to get everyone involved as best as possible, so best foot forward, so we can really build up a story of what we can expect from populations that goes beyond YQ. Because sometimes we make generalizations on what a population does based on a single experience. So we really want to get as many people involved to broaden that up. Anyone else want to add anything? I, I think the, the conversation with DEFRA is also going to be a continuing one throughout this because um, it, it's not just the legislation, you know, from 1964 that's shaped um, farming. It's, it's also the, the, all the processes that are, built, that are built up in that time around it. And at the moment, we have the, 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 the starting point is, is quite a formalized way of um, agreeing what is a new population, what is a land race. So I think that is a conversation that needs to evolve. We need to demonstrate the strength and the, you know, the potential from these local land races, from farmer breeding and that sort of thing, and have, have something that is far more fluid, far more dynamic. It's really important that there's that integrity, that it has a unique identity, that we're not, what we're not doing is by the back door just opening up somebody who's mixing three or four varieties and calling it a land race. There has got to be something genuinely new about this. But if, if there is something genuinely new, I think it's in everybody's interest to get that recorded and start to build up these family trees and understand how they're evolving, how, you know, understand the value of them. I just wanted to add the other thing is the value of them in the supply chain. So Josiah said it, Rosie said it, is that what's, what are you growing it for? Where's your market? So one of the things that this group and working with groups across the country is to look at how we can get, starting off with small scale, people growing for food rather than just as a commodity, people being able to connect with the customer directly if possible and developing crops that suit the, the human gut and soils without synthetics and joining that circle. One more and then we're, we're really pushing it and everyone needs a biscuit so <laughs> one, more, one more question. Uh, some, Vanessa, at the front there, you've, you've got a question. That's super quick, though. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's always bad timing when someone's calling you and you're about to ask a question. You spoke about developing crops for the gut microbiome. I've just finished my doctorate, and that's on the impact of bread on the gut microbiome and mental health. And I wondered if any of the population grains have been developed specifically with diversity and higher levels of polyphenols in them as a cheap, kind of cheap source of the fibers that can optimally feed the gut. I wondered if anybody's worked on those kind of that framework of actually developing to optimally nourish the gut. So rather than feeding people, nourishing them. 
I think, I think that is ultimately the aim. Um, polyphenol testing is very expensive. We haven't done much of that. I suspect that if we were to start doing that, we'd find that some of the work that Ed and others are doing would, would suggest higher levels than, than, um, than, in, than in some of the, the monocultural varieties. Talking of nourishment, and I know that time's running out, <laughs> please come and get a biscuit. They're also on the way. Oh, sorry. And there are biscuits at the back too. Where are the biscuits? Yay. Biscuit people, Yay. front, back. You can't leave without a biscuit, so go and get a biscuit. <laughs> Taste the diversity and the deliciousness. Thank you.